right, good morning, everybody. How you doing, New Hope Windward? Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, uh, good to see you, all of you, in our different locations, especially if you're watching online. Uh, if you're watching online, today is literally the day after we had that false uh, alert of the missile coming to Hawaii, and uh, Davey talked about it during announcements, but I thought, you know, we should spend some time, at least a few minutes, talking about this before we jump into today's message, because uh, there are a lot of different feelings and emotions about what happened yesterday, right? Some of you are undoubtedly uh, angry or frustrated about how something like this could have happened or why did it take 38 minutes to send, you know, the all clear, this is a false alarm type of a thing. Um, so there's anger, there's frustration. On the other side, I know a lot of us, hopefully all of us experience just uh, kind of a renewed sense of gratitude, right? Like, thank you, Jesus, that it really wasn't true, that it was a false alarm. And I think what was if there was anything positive to come out of it is that it really kind of showed each and every one of us uh, what was really important, right? What was really important in life and who is the most important in your life? I've heard so many stories uh, of people calling up family, relatives on the mainland uh, and just kind of in a way saying like, this could be goodbye, you know, but I love you. And uh, it just really shows you like what's important and who's important in your life. And if you're like me, when you saw the alert, and I saw, you know, inbound missile, all those things. And it said, seek shelter. And I don't know if you're like me, but, you know, in Kaneohe, I'm like, and where is that? <laughs> right? Like, and where am I supposed to go? Like, where is this shelter you speak of? And so I'm looking for what room in my house is the most, like, central. Like, do I, ha do I have time to go to my backyard, dig a huge hole, fill it with concrete, right? Like, there's just so many thoughts of, I don't know where to go, right? And I don't know if you thought that same thing, too. Maybe you were one of the parents who threw your kids down the storm drain. Hopefully you picked them back up again because, just a reminder, they might still be down, be down there, right? So, um, but in that, I think it's really important when it, as I was thinking about it, it is so important for us to know uh, what Psalm 18 tells us. And it tells us, in, starting from verse two, that the Lord is my fortress. He's my refuge. He's my shield. He's my shelter that I run to. And I think it's so important that we know, yeah, we can clap for, for that because it's true, right? I mean... And maybe some of you kind of got to the place where I was, where I was like, well, you know, if, if it's over, it's over. At least I know I'm going to be in heaven, see Jesus, and I'm with my family, right? And I think that kind of security is something that not everybody has, to be honest. And so I want to make sure we make some time at the end of today's message where if you feel like uh, if that were to happen again, if it was going to be for real, do you know for sure where you're going to end up? Like, where are you going to be? Are you going to be with Jesus in heaven, uh, and with loved ones who are also followers of Christ. And so we wanna make sure you have that time. But I was thinking and praying about it, like, God, do you want us to just kind of change the whole message today? Should we really spend the whole day talking about uh, what has just happened uh, as opposed to what we had planned? And I really felt like he was saying, no, go ahead and stay with what is planned because we're talking about, and we, we intentionally started off the new year with a series called Detox because we wanted to talk about how do we kind of shed and get rid of all of the, the bad toxic habits that we have so that we can make room for the blessing of God in our lives for 2000, 2018. And finances is a huge, huge part of that, which is what we're talking about today. And I think now that everything is in the all clear, at least for now, it is so important to make sure that we get all these different areas of our lives in order just so that we can be more ready. And, and our finances is such a huge part of our lives, right? I don't think I have to explain why money is important, uh, what it, it enables you to do, how we need it to pay rent, how we need it to buy groceries, all of those things. And so it's a really, really important thing. And Jesus had a lot to say in the New Testament about money management. And so what he talks about, especially in money, he uses it in a lot of different uh, illustrations and allegories and things about the kingdom of God and whatnot. But basically, uh, he's very clear that how we handle money, how we faithfully or unfaithfully steward our finances shows God something. And ultimately, it shows God how faithful or unfaithful we're gonna be in true riches or in spiritual blessings. That's in Luke chapter 16 and other... Uh, parts of the Gospels as well. But in Luke chapter 16, uh, at the end of verse 13, he says, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And so what he's saying is money is important. He talks about it a lot. But money cannot take the place of God in your life 
and mine. And for a lot of us, if we're just honest, it's really easy to make money the number one thing or the most important thing in our lives, right? It's so much easier to get focused on our job, what is our income, on paychecks and, and dollars and cents. It's really, really easy to put money in the place of God when God says, I alone have, should have that spot in your life, and money can be under that. And so that's really what we're going to learn about. Because when you talk about detoxing uh, financially, we're talking about good habits and bad habits, right? Now, we all have good habits, uh, and the same thing is true financially, right? How many of us, by show of hands, are savers by nature? So, you, you know, you make money, and your first instinct is, is to save, right? Okay, you guys are always so shy, except for the front row over here. But yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, so the shavers, I was like, oh, yes, that's me. Okay, if you didn't raise your hand, I'm assuming you're like me and you're a spender. Can I see the hands of the spenders over here? Yes, come, my brethren, let us unite and be unashamed. Because it is not a sin, it's not a bad habit to spend money, right? If you don't spend money, you don't got anything, right? But uh, saving is a good habit. It's not uh, spending that's a bad habit, it's overspending, right? It's spending money that we don't have and just kind of being unwise with that. Now, I can be the best person at that in the world. I, I, have, I can fall into really bad habits of overspending, and I certainly have in the past. And so that's one of those things that we just want to talk about. We want to detox from those bad habits, make room for the blessing of God in our lives, especially in our finances. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to hear a video teaching from Dave Ramsey, because I kind of felt like if I were to stand up here and talk to you about finances, I just... For me, honestly, I feel like I'm really still trying to figure all that stuff out. Like, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm the best uh, financial steward, but all the things that Dave Ramsey is going to talk about, uh, he also talks about in Financial Peace University, which is a class that we offer. We've, we've offered it seven times already, and it's coming up in February. I'll talk more about that later. But uh, when I took that class, my wife and I, and we've been doing the things that Dave Ramsey talks about, it's really kind of shifted our lives and changed our lives for the better. And so you're going to get a little taste of Financial Peace University just in Dave Ramsey's teaching. And I'll tell you, if you're feeling kind of uncomfortable about this right now because we're going to talk about money, I totally, I understand. All right? It's a sensitive topic. It's not... Uh, it's not easy for anybody to say, yeah, I would like some advice on money. Because if you're like me, especially a couple years ago, I was just in a spot where I was like, I don't want anybody to tell me like, what I'm supposed to do with my money. I just hated that feeling. Do you guys know what I'm saying? It could just be a guy thing. It might just be pride. Well, it is pride is what it is. But I just was so uncomfortable, especially in church when we would talk about money. Uh, and what I had to kind of get over is the fact that that is pride. You know, we should just call it what it is. It's pride. And, and there's a fear behind that because I just didn't want people to know, oh, you know, I do have debt or I, I don't know how to budget, right? And I never have, or I do overspend. You know, I just, I didn't want people to know that. So there's fear, there's pride, there's all these things. And I'm just letting you know, if you will knock that down and if you will just open yourself up to God, he's gonna do something amazing in your life. And so two years ago, my, my wife wanted to sign up to take uh, FPU, Financial Peace University. And I was kind of like, nah, you no need, right? Like, we don't have to do that. And then she just kept talking about it. So I was like, well, okay, happy wife, happy life. So we'll just do it. And then I remember walking into that first FPU class with my arms crossed and just like, I'm only here because I'm supposed to be, <laughs> you know, because I got signed up to be here. And uh, Dave Ramsey started teaching on video. And I just remember having this moment where I kind of like uncrossed my arms and I just said to God, God, I'm here for you. Right? Uh, and the truth is, Dave Ramsey is not the savior of finances. Jesus is. And what, but the great thing is Dave Ramsey talks about what Jesus says. It all comes from God's word. And I just had that moment where I said, God, I'm here for you. Help me to just break down any walls that I might have. I want to receive everything that you have for me and nothing less. So help me get to that place. And I want to help you get to that place where you're just ready to receive the things that God has for you. Proverbs 10 verse 17 says, people who accept discipline or instruction is the literal word are on the pathway to life, but those who ignore correction will go astray. And so just uh, in the past two years, just being coached and, and being instructed in how to manage my money the way that God talks about, it's really, really changed our lives. And I, and I honestly can say, we've been married for 10 years now. We just made 10 years this past December. And I wish I had done this 10 years ago, right? Because it really has changed um, our lives. And it's one of the best things that I've ever done for my marriage and for my family. So I want to encourage you, if you're even thinking about it, Really open yourself up to the possibility of not just today's message, but the possibility of taking an FPU class that's coming up 
next month, okay? For some of us, this might be a review for you. You maybe have gone through FPU. I know a lot of us in this church have, or you, you're, you've heard Dave Ramsey's teaching a lot. But I wanna encourage you not to tune out and recline and fall asleep because I believe there's something for you in the review as well. Maybe God is asking you this year as an assignment to become a financial mentor to someone or to others. Or maybe he's gonna kind of just nudge you to say, hey, you know, you should tell this person in your life about FPU and maybe go an extra step and pay for their registration. So just saying, if, if this is a review for you, keep your, your heart open because God is still gonna speak to you in this time, all right? We're gonna get into Dave Ramsey. I'll come up right after that. So watch this. We're gonna talk a little bit about money today. You know what I found out about money? Money's fun. <laughs> if you got some. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, the other thing I found out about money is most people, well, aren't doing real good. You know? I mean, if you've made big time mistakes with money, you know what that makes you? Over 12. <laughs> Most people have. How many of you ever done something stupid? Raise your hand. Yeah, man, I tell you, how many of you didn't raise your hand have a problem with lying? I mean, it's a real deal out there. It's easy to fall over in this money thing. And the weird thing is we all think everybody else is the one that has got it together and we're the only stupid ones. The devil has lied to us. He's told us this shame and guilt story about ourselves and, and made us believe it. When I went broke 20 years ago and lost everything and had to start completely over, I believed I was the only one that had ever done something that stupid, that completely out of control. And I, I did go broke. I've got a PhD in DUMB. <laughs> I am fully qualified to teach this stuff. I started with nothing and grew up not rich. How I many of you guys grew up not rich? I grew up not rich, and I, I, I remember graduating from college, broke, and married my beautiful wife, Sharon. We started off broke. We were eating off a card table, driving a 1902 Pinto. <laughs> now, you remember how you start out. You know what I'm talking about. We ain't got money, honey, but we got love. <laughs> and it's a good thing, too, because we ain't got no money. <laughs> and uh, I started buying and selling real estate. This was back in the 80s, 20 years ago. And I was pretty good at it. I'm kind of a math nerd, and I grew up in the real estate business. And by the time I was 26 years old, I had a little over a million dollars in real estate net worth, $4 million in real estate, making $250,000 a year. It was fun. We were having a blast. You know, sometimes I hear these people say, all those rich people are miserable. Uh-uh. <laughs> Now, I'm not here to tell you money's going to make you happy, and I'm not here to tell you it makes you a good Christian or any of that kind of stuff. That's not my gig. It's not what I do. I don't have enough hair to teach that material. But the, uh, the truth is, that the, the thing is that, that I have found, though, is, is that as we made all of that money, it didn't fix our lives. It just made us more of who we already were. The moral of the story is if you get rich and you're a jerk, you just become a colossal jerk. If you get rich and you have a big heart, they call you a giver, and they give it a big, long name, a philanthropist. If you get rich, you become more of what you are as you build wealth. So be careful of what you are. We learned that on the way up, and we learned it on the way down. Because I borrowed too much money, and the bank got sold to another bank, and they called our notes. <laughs> Step up on this rug, and we will pull it. And I went... Yes, that's me. <laughs> Young and stupid. And I did it. And they called our notes, not because we had done anything wrong, not because we'd done anything illegal or immoral. They freaked out. Bankers freak out sometimes. Have you all noticed? <laughs> and um, we spent the next two and a half years of our life losing everything we owned. We were sued and foreclosed on. And finally, with a brand new baby and a toddler and a marriage hanging on by a thread, we were bankrupt. This stuff will mess with your marriage, won't it? Number one cause of divorce in North America today, money fights and money problems. Number one thing people fight about in their marriage is money. And we did. Sharon would have left. We, she just didn't have the money. 
I mean, we fought, baby. We didn't get a divorce. We held on to each other, but sometimes it was just to get a better grip. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> She's from the hills of East Tennessee. Frying pan throwing there is an Olympic event. <laughs> and we hit bottom. I was on one of these news stations. I do all this TV work these days, and one of these talking heads asked me the other day, so, 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 so you, you started with nothing, and you became a millionaire, and then you lost everything, and now you're a multimillionaire, so how did you bounce back? I was like, dude, when you fall that far, you really don't bounce. <laughs> it's more of a splat. I sat around and blamed everybody else. You ever blame everybody else when you do something stupid? kind of a problem in our culture today, you know. Turns out McDonald's does serve hot coffee. <laughs> so, you know, I, I sat there, and, and, and the weird thing was is I do everything back, backwards. I, I didn't grow up in church, and I met God on the way up. Most people meet him, you know, at the bottom of their mess, right? But I met him on the way up. I got to know him on the way down. It'll teach you. This thing called pain... It'll make you open a Bible. See, I've got all these letters and licenses and things after my name that says I'm supposed to know something about money. And there I sat, broke. No money. And then this guy told me the Bible had some stuff to say about money, and I went, really? Okay. I'll try that one. Mine didn't work. And I started studying people like Larry Burkett and Ron Blue and many of the other great writers in Christianity around the world that have opened the Scriptures for us on this subject and I discovered this really easy stuff. It's easy to understand, and it works every time, but it's really hard to do because biblical finance, like so many other things, personal finance, the, the attributes and things you need in your life to be able to win with money, well, it's about 80% behavior. It's only about 20% head knowledge. Most of you know what to do. You're just not doing it. You're like me. The problem with my money is this idiot I shave with. <laughs> the guy in my mirror is my issue. If I can get him to behave, he can be skinny and rich. <laughs> so the stuff we're going to talk about out of the Bible, it's not like hard to understand. It's devastatingly easy to understand. You're going to be going, oh, good, I had a V8. It really does work that way. It's pretty easy stuff. So, you know, we're going to write some of this down and we're going to think about it as we go. I want to cover five of the basics of biblical finance. Some of the first things I learned, and I still believe they're probably the most important things I've ever learned in my life about money, and I have learned a lot about money over the years. But this stuff, if you do these five things, it works every single time. It'll take some time. Now, if you're looking for easy, it's not going to work. We don't sell microwaves here. We sell crockpots. <laughs> going to take a while. You got to cook it a while, but it'll taste better. Have you noticed most things in your spiritual life are that way? They're not instantaneous. You don't get this, and all of a sudden, you're a perfect husband. Didn't work that way. No. Took 27 years, and still not even close to the word perfect. I'm working on the P part still. But, you know, it's a process, isn't it? And this thing called money is the same exact thing. But to the extent you and your family will engage in these five activities, you will win with money. First thing you want to do if you want to win with money is you need to learn to get out of debt. Get out of debt. Now, that's pretty basic stuff. No kidding, Dave. That's a great idea. But, I, you know, the, the truth is debt equals risk. I have done detailed research, in-depth research, and I have found out that 100% of the foreclosures occur on homes with a mortgage. <laughs> debt equals risk. The way the Bible says that, it says the borrower is slave to the lender. You ever felt that way? Oh, I felt that way. I know what that feels like. It's called less than fun. You know, slaves don't have any options. They have to do what they're told. They put bumper stickers on their car that says, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. <laughs> they're stuck. Slaves have to keep a job they hate because they got to pay the bills. Slaves aren't really generous people either. It's hard for them to give. It's hard to give when you can't hardly just pay the bills that you owe. Got a lot of masters in your life. It's hard to serve two masters, Jesus said. You hearing the Bible ringing through this? It's there. It's 
it's hard to live like this. When all the money comes in and all the money goes out, only the names are changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> Your checkbook sounds like a wind tunnel. <laughs> Straight through. <laughs> and one old boy, he said, I just want direct deposit to the grocery store. It all goes over there anyway. <laughs> car payments, fleeced your car. You got master card. Who named that anyway? You discovered bondage or American distress. It's real, isn't it? It's real. People got a student loan that's been around so long they think it's a pet. But what would it be like to have no payments? What would it be like to make the decision that I'm going to get completely out of debt? You know, I got rid of my credit cards after I went broke. Number one, they took them. But number two, I never went back and got them again. Because, you know, I got to talking to millionaires. And I've never, I've talked to thousands of millionaires in my life. I have never met a millionaire who said, Dave, you know, I made it all with my Discover points. <laughs> Those airline miles, that was my breakthrough financial moment. <laughs> I have never heard that. And yet I have met with hundreds of thousands of families who have been less than blessed by these things. To the point you could even say they were cursed. Well, you can use them responsibly. Well, yeah, you can use a lot of stuff responsibly. It's stupid. And that's your rationalization. I have debit cards, one on my business, one on my personal account. And it turns out they do everything your credit card will do except put you in debt. The only problem is you have to have the money. You can't buy stuff you don't have. We'll get to that in a minute. So we just said goodbye to Home Depot. See you later, J.C. Penney's. Buy Sears. We'll have to buy your tools at the flea market. Victoria's Secret. <laughs> they take cash. It's okay. It's okay. And so we went about the business of having plastic surgery. A plastectomy, if you will. And you know, the weird thing is, if you don't have any payments, breathe that in for just a second. What if you didn't have a car payment? You know, the average car payment in America today is $478 over 84 months. If you take $478 and invest that in a decent growth stock mutual fund from age 30 to age 70, you'll have $5.6 million. Hope you like the car. <laughs> You're trapped by buying stuff you don't need with money you don't have to impress people you don't really like. Because there you sit in that $600 car payment at the stoplight going, <laughs> just impress somebody you'll never meet. That cost you 1000 bucks just then. You got to make a decision how you're going to live. And I figured this out to be true. When we went broke, the borrower truly is slave to the lender. And I decided I wasn't going to live that way anymore. And I drew a line in the sand and I said, I'm done. Now, I got to tell you, it means you don't get to do some things that you really want to do. But it turns out if God wants you to do something, he'll send you the money. Shut up. <laughs> Quit your whining. Really, because that's what debt is. It's financial whining, isn't it? I want it. It's <laughs> exactly what it is. And then you use these sophisticated words and language and intellect to completely rationalize it, and it feels all good to you, and everybody looks at you as going, you are so stupid. You look good, but you are dumb. And that's what's going on. And it's going on all around the world right now. It turns out that this is not some ancient scripture. It's the truth. It's how things work. The second one is you need to act your wage. You need to learn to live on less than you make. You are not in Congress. <laughs> the Bible says it this way. It says, a foolish man devours all he has. If you spend everything you make, according to Scripture, you're a fool. Now, don't get mad at me. God said it. But I've been there. I've been a fool. And you don't want to be a biblical fool. This is not a greeting like, hey, fool, okay? <laughs> this is like, this is uh, when you read about a biblical fool in Proverbs, uh-uh. This is somebody who hasn't got a chance. And you don't have a chance if you spend everything you make. You have to learn to live on less than you make. And, you know, that leads you to the Scripture that says godliness with contentment is great gain. 
You know, contentment is probably the most powerful financial principle there is. Because if you're okay with your car, if you're okay with your clothes, if you're okay with your house, if you're okay, suddenly you can just kind of calm down and the debt starts going away and the savings can come and the giving will happen and life starts flowing the way it's supposed to. But instead, we are in the feverish, feverish acquisition mode all around the world. Oh, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And we don't think we've got the gimmies. We don't feel like one of those four-year-old kids that we say, you had the gimmies. We don't say, say that to ourselves, but that's the way our culture has been acting and reacting. And I've done it too. I've done it with zeros on the end, so I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just saying it doesn't work because you're a fool. And fools don't prosper. So act your wage. It's the only chance you got. And, th and then we need to get on a budget. If you worked for a company called You Incorporated and you manage money for You Incorporated the way you manage money for You now, would you fire you? Don't answer that. <laughs> if your job was to manage money, I mean, it's amazing to me. People do stupid stuff and then they say, Lord, bless me. And God's going, uh-uh. <laughs> no, I mean, if you read the parable of the talents, those that manage well get to do more. That's what it says. If you take care of the little things, you're, you're, you're trustworthy to others. I got 250 people working on my team right now. If I got somebody misbehaves in the little things, you think I promote them to run the whole deal? I mean, if you're working at Burger King and you do a great job, you know, they'll promote you from fries to Whopper Flopper, <laughs> right? And if you keep going and do a bad job, do you think you get to be regional manager? No, you get go back to the fries if you do a bad job. I've got a teenage son and... And I've been teaching him to drive over the last many, many years. And he's been driving now for a couple of years. And we're doing, doing pretty good with it. And so far, no problems and lots of threats from dad. But, um, you know, when he's 16 years old, you know what he is behind the wheel? Incompetent. Okay? The state will give him a license, but that doesn't make him competent. So you think I'm giving this boy a viper? You think he's getting a new Corvette and go from zero to 60 in 3.2 seconds? No, he gets a 92 Chevette. You know? Give him something he can't hurt himself with because he's not competent. You know why? Because I'm a loving father. I'm only going to give him what he can handle and has shown competence to handle because if he's not competent to handle it, it won't be a blessing to him. Oh, he'd be excited to get a brand new Corvette. But that doesn't mean it'd be a blessing. He'd probably kill himself in it or somebody else worse, you know? And so, you know, your loving father is not going to give you stuff that will harm you. And if you can't handle a little bit of money, he's not going to give you a bunch of it. You'll look like you won the lotto and be bankrupt in five years. Get out of control with yourself. So, got to get on a plan. Jesus said it this way. He said, for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost to see whether he has enough to finish it? Lest he get halfway up and is unable to finish. And all who see him began to mock him and say, this man began to build and was unable to finish. You better have a plan or you'll get halfway up and you'll be unable to finish. That's Jesus. Read it. Red letters. That's the man talking. Don't build it. You wouldn't build a house without a blueprint. If you hired a contractor to build a $4 million house and he laid out a paper bag on the front of his truck and said, we're just going to do it like this and started sketching. <laughs> You'd be going, uh-uh, no, 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 next. And that's exactly what God does. So in your working lifetime, you're going to handle four, $5 million, $6 million, $10 million. Act like it. Be responsible. Be an adult on paper, on purpose, before the month begins. Sit down, give every dollar a name and agree on it with your spouse for those of you that are married. You got to do it. You won't win unless you do. The next one is you have to learn to save money. If you don't save money, you'll be broke your whole life. See, for years I was really good at earning money, but I wasn't good at handling money, so I tried to out-earn my stupidity. <laughs> yeah, that's happened to other people, I can tell. You can't out-earn your stupidity. You have to learn to save money. And we teach people to save money for three basic things. Number one, we teach them to save for an emergency fund. Now, Grandma said that. Grandma said to save for a rainy day, rainy day. visual aid. <laughs> you need to save for a rainy day. You know why? It's going to rain. Get ready. Money Magazine says 78% of you will have a major negative financial event in any given 10-year period of time in your life. 
something's going to happen. The transmission's going to go out. A kid's going to get sick. Aunt Gertie's going to die, and we got a barrier. Something's going to come up. You're going to get laid off. The unexpected pregnancy, which has always kind of tickled me. <laughs> but here, you know, here, here's the deal. You better be ready. Life's coming. It's coming. And if you hadn't lived long enough for life to knock you over, I'm just here to warn you, I'm an old guy. It's going to knock you over. And it's kind of cool if life shows up and you have money. Because you know what this is? It's Murphy repellent. You know who Murphy is. If it can go wrong, it will. When you have an emergency fund of three to six months of expenses set aside, Murphy will leave you alone. He will visit your neighbors. <laughs> have you ever noticed that when you're broke is when everything goes wrong? Your life looks like a country song. But when you put $10,000 or fifteen dollars or $20,000, whatever three to six months of expenses is, because that ought to be your emergency fund, between you and life, life says, hmm, that one's ready, I'll leave him alone. And he backs off in the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil. Wise people save choice food and oil. You're wise if you save. You're a fool if you devour all you have. You're getting the parallels here, the, the perpendiculars here. They're all here for you. God's just being real plain. He's telling you, kiddo, I love you, and this is your little instruction book. If you do it this way, it works. If you don't do it, it, it doesn't. Now, it's not a sin if you don't. Debt is not a sin. It's biblically stupid. <laughs> but it's not a salvation issue. It's your father going, mm, 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 mm. What am I going to do? That's one of my stupid kids. <laughs> you know? The second thing you need to save for other than emergencies is you need to save up and pay cash for things. If you pay cash for things, you know what happens? You spend less. If you take 10 or 15 Uncle Benjamin Franklin's $100 bills and put those in your pocket, you carry them around a little while, you become kind of attached to them. It's kind of like Uncle Ben. It's part of the family, right? And then you just go, you get ready to spend something, you lay one of these things down, you have an ouchy moment. It's like, ah, I don't think I want that. Completely changes the whole equation. McDonald's did focus group studies, and they found with credit cards that you spend 47% more out of McDonald's than if you spend with cash. You know why? Because it hurts. You're standing there with that plastic going, okay, supersize that, give me the apple pie, and I'll pay for his. <laughs> right? You walk up with this thing, you're like, uh, dollar menu, you're on your own. <laughs> Changes the whole perspective of things, doesn't it? When you spend this, you feel it. There's an emotional attachment to this. And Dun & Bradstreet did a study on other things that says you spend 12 to 18% less than when you spend with plastic. Buy with cash. Plus, you can kind of just go in the stereo store and walk around. <laughs> and they'll go, oh, well, can we help you? <laughs> yeah, I bet you get service, don't you? And then you go up to pay, and the little guy goes, whoa, dude, like this one's got real money. Uh, get the manager. I don't know how to ring this up. <laughs> But you can get a deal doing this, can't you? It embarrasses my wife. She says, you embarrass me. Well, that's just a side benefit of the process. <laughs> and guess what? If you save money, you also learn to invest money. Do you know $100 a month invested in a decent growth stock mutual fund from age 30 to age 70 is $1,176,000? Pizza and cable money, and you can retire with dignity. For what we spend on lattes, you can avoid retiring and buying the cookbook 72 ways to prepare Alpo and love it. <laughs> invest for your future. Invest for your kid's college. Invest. But you're not having any money to invest if you didn't have money for emergencies and if you hadn't stayed out of debt and if you're not on a plan. See how these things start to work together? If you start working a simple system like this and you really do it, it'll rock your world. It'll change everything and it'll allow you to do the last one. And that's give. Oh, this is the best thing you can do with money. This is the most fun there is with money. Now, you know, certainly you can tithe to your local church. That's the basics. We start there, right? But, I mean, you get a little bit of money, you can have some fun. Got a lady working on our team. And she... Um, 
We give out profit sharing bonuses. We share our profits. What a neat idea with the people that work for us. And, uh, and, and you know, her bonus every month, she's been with us a while, is three, four, five hundred bucks a month, depending on how good our profits are. She does pretty good at just on the bonus, you know. And, and she and her husband decided a few years ago, they're not rich people, but she, she, she decided that they were going to start a ministry. And, and, and what they do is they take their profit sharing check and, and, and they cash it in cash and they go to the local Waffle House. And they pray before they go in that God will seat them at somebody's seat that waits on them that needs some help. She said, the first time we did it, we went in there and the little lady was pregnant. And she's like, thank you, God. Because listen, if you're pregnant and you're working in Waffle House, you know what? You need a job. <laughs> this is somebody's working because they need to. You know? No, no, not picking on Waffle House or anything, but that's tough work, right? Can you imagine what happened when they left a $400 tip and went to the car? How fun is that? Dave, thanks so much for sharing the profits with us. My husband and I are having so much fun. We decided based on a suggestion of you last Thanksgiving to create our Waffle House ministry. We take money from the profit sharing, set it aside, and then we pray for God to give us wisdom and, a, and place a person that needs the extra money as our waitress. Then we enjoy a fun meal, leave a big tip, and leave feeling giddy. The last waitress we had was very young and very pregnant, and as soon as she walked up to our table, I thought, wow, God, this is going to be so cool for her is that broke people can't do that. <laughs> people that don't live on a plan and have a bunch of payments can't do that. People that don't save money can't do that. We've got forums on our website at My Total Money Makeover and the people with the forums all, all write in and stuff. And one of the ladies wrote this in the other day. She sent this to us. Um, she says, I bought my husband, who's a captain in Iraq right now, a 97 Mazda Miata. A 97 Mazda Miata. So when he comes home from Iraq, it'll be here. It has 108,000 miles on it. I paid $2,800 for it. Fully aware it needed repairs, and I had budgeted about $3,000 for the repairs. I posted a picture on the Total Money Makeover boards because it's our first cash card. It's so not like the hoopties that we hear about. A couple days later, I received a FedEx envelope from a member of the TMO board. Inside was a heartfelt letter and a check for $1,000 to go towards the repairs. This was from someone who had gotten out of debt and was living on a plan. They were living like no one else, and now they were able to live like no one else. I can't begin to tell you the impact that had on me, having had a really hard year with my husband gone, and especially hard month this month. The gift wiped away so much pain and bitterness for a military wife. A thousand dollars. That's a big hit for a thousand bucks. I mean, there are people that drop a million dollars on something and don't get that much fun, or as much fun as 400 bucks on a waitress. Oh my gosh. It'll change your world. It'll rock your world. But you can't do all of these things unless you do all of these things. You can't just get out of debt. You got to save. You can't just save if you don't get out of debt. If you don't have a written plan, it's not going to work. It all weaves together, people. This is how it works. You know why? Because God's not concerned about your money. He doesn't care about your money. He cares about you. He's crazy about you. He's got a plan for you. And he's saying to you, my children... This is how you live. And if you'll live this way, you'll win. And, and what he's trying to do is he's trying to change the person in your mirror. He wants you to be a better person. Goodness gracious. He wants you to win at a level you've never won before. I mean, how many of us that have kids? I mean, we want good things for our kids. And if we be an evil, do that. How much more so our Father in heaven? Wow. He's got a game plan for your money. How whacked is that? And it works every single time without fail every time you work this it'll work does it work without any bumps in the road no being a servant doesn't work without any bumps in the road but it is the way to live your life right so there's bumps in the road get ready there's going to be people that make fun of you broke people will make fun of your plan which is always a good sign by the way <laughs> If broke people are making fun of your financial plan, that's like fat people making fun of your exercise plan. Yeah. This is encouraging. So, so think this through. God has a game plan. Do these basic things over and over. Get out of debt. Act your wage. Live on a written plan. Learn to save because you're going to need it. And then most of all, become an awesome, out of control, abundant mentality giver. 
when the whole thing, that's when you know you hit it. That's when you know you hit the sweet spot and the ball's going out of the park. You can feel it then. I encourage you. It's not an easy trip, but it's a trip worth taking. God says to live like no one else so that later you get to live like no one else. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but it yields a harvest of righteousness. It works every time. If you pay a price to win, take these five things and go change your world. Is that good? You guys like Dave Ramsey? Good stuff, right? There's something that he said at the very end that I kind of didn't catch in the other services, but he said if you do these things over and over again, and I'm just, uh, you know, here to tell you, for the past two years, my wife and I have been, been doing that, I've been doing the five things, and uh, it, it's working. You know, I know that there are other things out there, there's other books and other people and everything like that, um, but this stuff just comes straight out of God's word, it's Financial Peace University stuff, and for the past years, we've been doing all those five things, and we've just been diligent in them. It has been difficult, because it's super easy to just be like, ah, you know, like, forget it or just you know to go back and backpedal and all those things um, but we've been doing that and we're not like millionaires or anything like that this isn't like a crazy health and wealth prosperity type thing uh, it's just God's money management you know and and we're still working that thing we're still paying off our debts and all of that uh, but it's it's it really is amazing and if, if you're even just thinking about it I just want to encourage you go to guest services check out FPU sign up because it, it is going to be so worth it especially if that's something that you're really looking for in the new year. And it'll just change the course of your life. In your, in your bulletin, there's this flyer for FPU. Has some really cool stats over here that we've had seven classes so far, 108 families have gone through it. And the amount of debt that's been paid off is $261,071. The amount of money that's been saved between the 108 families is $303,869. And that's only when they were taking the class, okay, for several weeks. So if they've been continuing to do that, to save and to pay off debt, uh, from the time they've taken their class, that number is way larger and we just, we just don't know. We just don't know how to track that. So it's, it's a really, really amazing thing. I just wanna encourage you, like nothing is impossible, right? I know some of us are maybe thinking right now, oh gosh, you know, it's like it's never worked for me or maybe you have accepted the, the thought that this is just how my life is gonna be till I retire, hopefully I can retire till I die. And it really doesn't have to be that way, right? Because God wants us to live a blessed life. God wants us to have his joy. God wants us to have a great measure of his peace. He wants his, his children to be blessed and really to thrive. And again, not like in a crazy health prosperity type thing, um, but that's what God wants for his people. And here's what I know, it, it, you can't just be casual about it, right? And I think Dave Ramsey talks about that. It takes a full commitment. Like you have to say, I'm 100%, I'm all in to Jesus and to his ways. And I'll tell you something about 100% commitment to God. It's that God rewards faithfulness, 100% commitment to him, 100% of the time. I love how it says it in Hebrews 11, verse six. It says that it is impossible to please God without faith. That's a verse that we all kind of know, and it's a really famous verse. But then it says this, the very next sentence, anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. See, some of us have bought into the lie that, uh, you know, God is angry with me, God is not gonna bless me, or I've messed up too much, God's not gonna, God's not gonna change my life. And that's just not biblical, right? We just read it straight out of the book of Hebrews. God is a rewarder when we say, I'm 100% committed to you and to your ways. Next week, we're gonna talk about how to detox physically. Pastor David's gonna talk about that. And I think these principles that we're talking about, just being all in, 100% commitment to God and to his ways, that stuff applies uh, when we talk about detoxing physically as well. Pastor David's gonna talk about fasting. And as a church, we're gonna go through a fast. I just wanna kind of prepare you for that. Uh, if you've been coming to this church for a while, we do that uh, a couple of times a year, we'll do uh, a fast like a three-day fast, and uh, there's different levels that you can commit to. And I just wanna, before Pastor Dave even talks about it, can I encourage you to just really try to commit to God's ways 100%. And when we do the fast, just go, like just go all the way in, fasting food, uh, and really see how God is gonna bless you and reward you for that. And here's the thing about God, when he blesses you, when, when he blesses your 100% commitment obedience, it's not always a blessing in the way that you're expecting. 
right? It's not always in the way that you think, oh, if I do this, God's gonna reward me with this. God usually has something totally different in mind, but it's always way better than what you hoped for or expected. And so, New Hope, I just want you to know this can be your year. Okay, this could be your year where financially your life just changes. And it, all it's gonna take is a little bit of faith and just saying, God, I believe that if I commit myself to you and to your ways, you're gonna do something. You're gonna change something. So it takes a little bit of faith and it takes the diligence to continue to do the things that you know God has called you to do. And if you do that, I believe you're gonna detox unhealthy habits. You're gonna make room for God to just bless your life financially. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Let's bow our heads in all of our locations. Let's close our eyes. I'm gonna lead us in a time of prayer. And as I pray for you, I really want you to open yourself up to God. And I want you to get ready to receive something that you didn't have when you walked in. Now, especially if you walked in here and, and maybe you didn't know we were talking about finances or now that you know we've been talking about finances, if you feel like, God, that's, I just need something like that. I need some supernatural blessing, some kind of supernatural activity in my life to help me in my finances. And I want you, as we're praying, to just get ready to receive that by faith. God is gonna change that around for you this year. And then I wanna make sure that anybody who wants to make sure they have that assurance of salvation, we're gonna do that as well. So let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for each and every person here. God, for anyone who is crying out to you right now, just in their hearts and their souls, for you to do financial miracles in their lives, for you to do some financial repair, God, I just come in agreement with them. And I know that you are a God who loves to save, who loves to bless, who loves to lead us into the better life, into green pastures. And so I thank you in advance, Jesus, for all of the financial repair, the miracles, the blessing that you're gonna pour out onto your people as they just focus on you, commit to you, and to your ways of money management. So receive that, receive that in faith. God is gonna do something if you'll commit to him this year. I just know for myself, I'm not making any more money than I have been in the past two years. And it feels like we have so much more because we've simply shifted our focus to manage money according to his word. And it's made all the difference. And so God, I pray that you would do that and more for everybody here who's praying that right now. For others of us, as we continue to pray, when I talked about earlier about the missile false alarm and just knowing for sure where your shelter is, your eternal shelter. If you walked in here today and you're saying, Hanzo, I don't, I don't, I'm not 100% sure that if my life ends here on earth, I'm gonna see Jesus in heaven. I wanna give you that assurance, but before I do, I wanna be as clear as I can be, because Jesus is also really clear about it, that he is not looking for just a small percentage of your life. He's not just looking for you to put him in a little convenient spot in his life whenever you have time, whenever you have an extra day, or just whenever you think of God kind of a thing. He's asking for your total surrender, for your 100% commitment of your very life into his hands. And maybe you're at that place today where you're thinking, yeah, that's, that's what I want to do. That's what I know I need to do because I've tried things my way and it just hasn't worked out the way I wanted it to. And you're, you're believing that giving your life to God is not just a quote unquote ticket to heaven, but it's the best way to live. It's how he designed you to live. It's what he wants for you. And more than just eternal salvation, he wants the best for you in this life, a relationship with you in this life. In the book of Matthew, Jesus says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. If you try to hang on to your life and steer it, it's gonna get away from you, you're gonna lose it. But if you give up your life for his sake, you will save it. You will find your life and save it. And so right now, if that's you, and you know, don't make this an emotional thing. Don't be like, well, yeah, it just kind of feels like the right thing to do. If you just know the bottom of your heart, the depth of your soul, that this is the commitment you wanna make, you wanna give your life completely, 100% to Jesus. It really is as simple as right now in your heart, just making that decision. God, I'm gonna do that. 
going to give my life to you right now. If that's you, I want to encourage you to follow along in this prayer of mine. You don't have to repeat it out loud, but just in your own heart, just say these words in your heart, in your mind, and agree with them. Father God, thank you so much for the gift of your son, Jesus. I believe today that he is who he says he is, that he is the only son of God, that he is also God in the flesh, and that when he came, and died on that cross, he did that for me, not because he was angry with me, but because he loves me and because he wanted to forgive me. It was his joy to do that. And I accept and receive that gift, that gift that I can never pay you, God, the penalty and the payment for all my sin. There's no way that I can do that, but I believe that Jesus took that upon himself and paid it for me. And now I wanna live the rest of my life honoring him for that. I want to honor him with my very life. I believe that three days later after he died for my sins, he rose again to a new life. And because he rose again to a new eternal life, he's taking me with him. And I know for sure that I'm going to be in heaven with Jesus. It doesn't mean that I'm going to be perfect. It doesn't mean that I'm going to have everything figured out. It just means that I have faith in the one who has overcome death and who has the keys to heaven and hell, and he's waiting for me. He's preparing a place for me in his Father's house, and I thank you so much for Jesus. I pray that this year would truly be a year that I see your blessing, your goodness, your faithfulness, and your provision. Love you, Jesus, and I thank you for all these things. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. Can we